A high performance experimental long care, tail number November 345 Lima Alpha, went down at night near Bradley, Arkansas on August 18, 2025. Tragically, the pilot, 54 year old Barry Bowes of Ultiwa, Tennessee, didn't survive. Bose was a Cube 3 architecture TA2 Series Pro-Am Challenge Champion. He drove the number 27 Axio Data SLRM 1 Chevrolet Camaro for Team SLR. What makes this crash so intriguing is the flight profile. Everything looked stable for nearly an hour then. Out of nowhere, the plane made some odd altitude changes, followed by a violent spiraling dive from almost 12,000 feet. The NTSB prelim report is out. Of course, it's not the final answer yet, but there's already a lot to analyze and some very real lessons to unpack here. Let's take a look. Let's start with what the data tells us. The Lancair departed Lakeway Air Park, Texas, just after 8.11 p.m. local time. Right out of the gate, the climb looked completely normal, up to around 10,000 feet mean sea level within a few minutes. For nearly 50 minutes, the airplane held that altitude, cruising northeast toward Arkansas. Nothing unusual there, but then things start getting a little weird. Around 9 p.m., the aircraft climbed again, first to about 12,000 feet, then topping out near 14,000 feet, which is pretty high for this type of flight. After holding that briefly, it dropped back down closer to 12,000 feet. And here's where it gets really crazy. At about 9.32 p.m., while at 11,800 feet, the plane suddenly snapped into a rapid right spiraling descent. A DSB data even shows a brief attempt at a level off and climb, almost like the pilot was fighting it, before it banked left and slammed into terrain. The wreckage tells its own story. Initial impact was a pine tree about 200 feet from where the main fuselage came to rest. Fragments of the right wing were found along that debris trail. The fuselage ended up upright, but the engine was inverted. Clear signs of a violent impact sequence. And then, of course, a post-crash fire destroyed most of the airframe. So what does this suggest? An abrupt, spiraling descent like that usually points to a loss of control, possibly made worse by disorientation at night, and with the right wing breaking up during the descent, investigators will have to figure out if structural overload happened before impact or because of the forces in that uncontrolled dive. Now let's talk about the people and the machine. The sole occupant was Barry Bowes, age 54. The airplane was registered through his LLC, 5 Lime Alpha, out of Tennessee. We don't yet have details on his exact experience level, but what we do know is this. He was flying a very demanding airplane. The Lancair NLA 275FRC is an amateur-built experimental. It's powered by a Continental IO550N, which gives it a lot of speed and climb performance, and that's the real selling point of a Lancair. They are blazingly fast, sleek, and efficient. But here's the flip side. That performance comes with a price. These airplanes have high wing loading and very sharp handling. They don't forgive sloppy inputs. They don't give you much margin in slow flight. And in a loss of control situation, recovery takes altitude, precision, and training. It's also important to remember, in the experimental category, these aren't type certified airplanes. Each one can be a little bit different depending on how it was built, finished, and maintained. That means pilots need to be intimately familiar with their specific airplane and stay sharp on the skills it demands. Now, I want to be clear here. We're not criticizing Barry. The fact that he was flying an aircraft like this at night shows he had both the passion and the confidence to take on such a machine. But it also highlights a reality in aviation. When you fly something this powerful at night, you're operating right on the edge of the performance envelope, where small mistakes, or even just bad luck, can have really serious consequences. Now let's step back and look at the bigger picture of conditions that night. On paper, the weather wasn't bad at all. Clear skies, just some scattered clouds around 8,000 feet, good visibility, and light winds. If you read that in a briefing, you'd probably think it was going to be an easy flight. But here's the kicker. It was after 9.30 at night, and that's where things get tricky. Out in rural Arkansas, you're not dealing with city lights or clear horizon lines. You're basically flying in a black void. That's the perfect setup for spatial disorientation. And the graveyard spiral is the classic trap here. Even experienced pilots can feel like their wings level when, in reality, 
The airplane is banking and tightening into a spiral. By the time the instruments tell you what's really happening, it may already be too late. And then there's something else worth pointing out. Those altitude changes earlier in the flight. The climb to over 14,000 feet and then a drop back to 12,000 is a little unusual for a straightforward night cross country. Was the autopilot being used? Was it maybe turned off or even malfunctioning? At that altitude, you also have to think about hypoxia. Above 12,500 feet, pilots are supposed to use supplemental oxygen. An extended exposure, without, it can sneak up on you. It's not dramatic. It's subtle, like slower reaction times, poor decision making, and just not noticing you're slipping behind the airplane. Add in possible fatigue from flying a demanding machine at night, and you've got a mix that can really eat away at a pilot's performance without them realizing it. From the technical side, there's a lot to consider too. The Landcare is a high-performance machine, but that high-wing loading I mentioned earlier has a dark side. Stalls come on faster, and recovery takes more altitude. In a sudden spiral at night, you might simply not have the margin to recover before impact. Then there's the structural side of the story. That debris trail with pieces of the right wing is something investigators are going to look at closely. In a steep spiraling dive, the airplane can pull extreme g-forces easily beyond design limits. It raises the question, did something start coming apart in flight? Or did the overstress happen because the pilot was trying to pull out of the dive? That's something only a detailed wreckage exam can answer, but it's an important angle. We should also think about weight and balance. Experimental aircraft like these don't have the same strict certification envelopes as factory-built planes. Loaded a little too far aft, or carry more fuel than expected, and the handling can change dramatically. It doesn't mean that's what happened here, but it's one of those technical questions worth asking. And just a quick word on the flight data. ADSB is great for big picture tracking, but it's not perfect. It can't capture every control input or the fine details of what the airplane was doing second by second. So while it looks like a spiral descent on the data, the truth of whether it was loss of control, a structural issue, or some combination of both that will only come out in the wreckage and the final report. So what can we actually take away right now at this early stage? First, flying experimental aircraft isn't like flying a Cessna or Piper. You're dealing with an airplane that demands precision, discipline, and constant proficiency. Add nighttime conditions and the margins for error get razor thin. Second, altitude brings its own invisible risks. Hypoxia doesn't feel like much when it's happening, but it can chip away at your judgment. And fatigue on a long evening cross country only makes that worse. These are the kinds of things we can control with habits, oxygen above 12,500, staying sharp with instrument scans, and being honest with ourselves about our condition before taking off. And finally, the open questions. Did structural failure play a role, or was the wing damage just the result of an uncontrolled dive? Was spatial disorientation the primary trigger? Or could there have been an engine or control system issue that started the whole chain? The truth is, we don't know yet. That's why the NTSB final report is so critical. But here's the big takeaway. Even in good weather, at night, in a powerful aircraft, the safety margin is a lot more fragile than it seems. And if there's one thing this tragic crash reminds us, it's that flying is never routine. It demands constant respect, especially when you're operating at the edge of performance. That's all we know for now. Remember, this is just the preliminary report. So the final NTSB findings will tell us more. In the meantime, let me know what you think. Was this more likely spatial disorientation, structural overstress, or something else? Drop a comment below, and if you want updates when the final report comes out, hit that subscribe button. Fly safe, and I'll see you in the next one.